Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about the medieval view of the world. So um, basically, what were people thinking more than 500 years ago in Europe? When we tend to think about the Middle Ages nowadays, um, that is when we tend to think about those many centuries that span the time between late classical antiquity and uh, what we call the modern age, that is the last 500 years or so. But when we focus on the time in between, uh, we tend to focus very much on either the limited technology that people had at the time or other things like political conquests, um, wars, uh, epidemics that were going on. So these sort of outer... Um, uh, superficial um, uh, outer facts of life, basically, that we focus on today. What we never really hear so much about, um, usually, is what people actually thought about the world. This comes to us in the form of books, um, but it sort of comes to us between the lines, because as soon as we're reading a work of literature from the Middle Ages, or actually written shortly after the Middle Ages as well, um, this very special worldview that they had, um, that people back then in general had, um, sort of is there between the lines, but at least I've never really heard anyone explain that worldview to me um, as far as I can remember. So this is something that I had to really um, educate myself on uh, when starting to deal with medieval and early modern literature. And so I thought I would make this um, video to um, tell you some of the most important or what I think important um, uh, facets um, about the medieval worldview. So this is the view of the world that we're dealing with as soon as we're reading an author like Chaucer, for example. Uh, and Chaucer just assumes, uh, of course, <laughs> as we all do, um, that um, his audience will sh share the same worldview. And so um, you rarely ever see um, any authors really explain um, their worldview in, in uh, general terms. So, for example, in Troilus and Chryside, we have the death of Troilus, spoiler, um, <laughs> Troiler dies, and his soul flies towards heaven. And here's what um, the narrator says. An Juan that he was slain in this manner, his lichte ghost full blissfully is went up to the hollow nesse of the eighte sphere, in converse letting every element, and there he saw with full of easement, the erratic stares, circling harmonia, with soon as full of heavenish melody. So even though we might have heard about the harmony of the heavens before, um, or a word like element, to be honest, a modern reader will probably not really know why um, Troilus's ghost is light, um, what it means to go up to the hollowness of the eighth sphere, um, what the word uh, converse um, might refer to there um, what erratic stars really means and so on. So we get a lot of technical terms here that um, we sort of need uh, probably a very heavily glossed, um, annotated uh, version of this text to really understand what's going on and what the narrator um, wants his readers to know here. So the model, the general um, model that we're talking about, uh, the classical view of the world, which was still true for the Middle Ages in general, but also um, still more or less true in early modern times, is called the Ptolemaic model because um, Ptolemaeus, uh, one of the ancient Greek philosophers, um, I guess described this model um, yeah, okay, and so uh, it basically goes back to classical antiquity, and it's a geocentric model. I think this part of the model is still pretty well known. The fact that geocentric means that uh, the Earth was thought to be the center 
of the cosmos. I almost said the center of the universe. It's not what they would have said back then, the center of the cosmos. So it's a geocentric model, and that's what this word means. The earth is round in this model. This might be a mind-blowing fact to some uh, people viewing this video, but the earth was already known to have a spherical shape. Spherical meaning three-dimensionally round, round like a ball. Not round like a pizza, but round like a ball. So the earth was not thought to be flat in general all throughout the Middle Ages as well as in classical antiquity already. If you're thinking about a flat earth model that also exists in human history, um, so flat earth models um, were around, uh, for example, around the time of the ancient Babylonians um, and so forth. But uh, we're not talking about ancient Babylon here, we're talking about um, late classical Europe and uh, medieval Europe. And in this time, it's clear um, that uh, almost everybody uh, knew that the earth was spherical and um, there were practically no flat earthers around. Um, let me say something more about this. Uh, you might have heard that um, people like Christopher Columbus um, thought the earth was flat and they tried to sail uh, to another part of the of the earth but people uh, laughed about them uh, or laughed at them or laughed about this idea um, that the earth should, should be round that's complete nonsense okay you can really forget that that's really an urban legend um, that's something that came up for the first time um, towards the end of the 19th century um, and it's really a fascinating little uh, detective story in and of itself to think about where did this whole idea that up, up until 500 years ago, everybody thought the earth was flat, uh, where did that actually come from? So that idea in and of itself is a very young idea that um, people not so long ago thought the earth um, was flat. Um, but they didn't. So uh, this is uh, maybe a, um, already the first little mind-blowing um, fact to concentrate on, which I'm not going to say more about, though. Okay, the Earth is stationary at the center of the cosmos in the Ptolemaic model. That is, the Earth um, is almost like the hub of a wheel. It doesn't move. The rest of the wheel, so to speak, um, moves around the Earth. By the way, when I say wheel, or when you look at these um, sort of depictions here taken from ancient books or, or early modern books, um, then it always tends to look very two-dimensional. It's not meant to look that way, okay? This is supposed to, you're supposed to think of this as a three-dimensional model, not as a two-dimensional model. It's just because it's harder to uh, depict, of course, um, on paper, um, uh, that stuff starts looking very flat um, as soon as you try to um, uh, make a picture of it. Um, Okay, um, so the Earth is stationary at the center of the otherwise moving cosmos, and the Earth itself does not move. Okay, what is moving are is everything else. For example, the seven classical planets that are circling the Earth. The seven classical planets, you can kind of see them here. Um, so counting from the innermost to the outermost, we have the moon as the first classical planet. Then we have Venus and Mercury. Then we have the sun, number four, in the middle. The sun is one of the classical planets. And then um, on the outer edge, so to speak, behind the sun, then we have Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Those are the five planets, well, seven if you count the sun and the moon, um, those are the, the seven heavenly bodies um, that you can see moving uh, with your own eyes, uh, with human eyes, without telescopes. Um, and then everything else uh, is called a fixed star. So those seven, the seven that I just talked about, are the erratic stars and the um, and everything else is a so-called fixed star. Um, there are nine spheres uh, in this classical model. Now, sphere is 
is a fancy word for ball, actually, right? So th think of three-dimensional, um, really ball-shaped um, objects. So the Earth itself is a sphere, and the Earth, the stationary Earth in the middle, is surrounded by nine further spheres, which get bigger and bigger and bigger, of course, towards the outside. Um, and they're all revolving around the Earth. And they're carrying, for example, the seven classical planets, they're somehow attached to these spheres, so that the spheres, as they turn, they're carrying these um, uh, stars uh, with different speeds. The outermost sphere has been called the first mover, the primo mobile, um, and this is a philosophical term going back to Aristotle, among others. Um, now, the first mover is a philosophical term. Um, you should think of movement maybe as a metaphor of existence. So if um, anything that exists um, came into existence, right? Uh, so that, that's just a different way of saying everything has a cause. And if everything has a cause, well, then where did anything at all come from? Well, then there must be a first cause, right? And uh, so that's kind of um, the thinking behind this. So everything is moving. So where's the first mover, right? Uh, and um, the outermost sphere, the sphere at the edge, so to speak, of the cosmos is thought to or was thought to um, have sparked all of the motion that you see. And that's also the fastest um, speed. So paradoxically, as the spheres grow bigger and bigger and bigger towards the outside, um, the speeds with which they move grow faster and faster and faster. So the, the, the largest object basically is moving the fastest. The Earth at the center is pretty small, and the cosmos around the Earth was thought to be huge. Um, basically, this is another thing to keep in mind when you see these diagrams here, um, like, you, like you see one here. It's not only that they look very two-dimensional, but they're supposed to be thought of as three-dimensional. It's also that they're just diagrams, so that uh, the Earth appears pretty big in these diagrams, and the rest of the cosmos is kind of, <laughs> kind of small around the Earth. It was actually the other way around. The Earth was thought to be tiny um, compared to the very big, very huge cosmos around the Earth. How big really? Um, of course, it's hard to, to express that uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, general um, modern measurements. But I think, um, judging by what some people wrote, um, that they already sort of felt that the distances between, the, at least between the seven classical planets, so, so the distances, uh, if you moved from the Earth to the outermost sphere, um, basically, everything in between there, I think comes very close to the distances that um, we know to be true about the solar system. So basically, you can think, well, maybe this, this medieval cosmos today would pretty much fit into the solar system if you um, look at um, all the known planets and as, uh, as they're revolving around the sun and how big that um, roughly is. That's roughly the size, I think. You can say that. Now, harmony is a big keyword here. Everything was uh, thought to be in harmony. So you also have this idea that the spheres are sort of touching, that they're always rubbing against one another as um, they move at faster and faster speeds towards the outside, and that this is creating some kind of cosmic music. Actually, music theory comes in here uh, quite a lot. Um, yeah, okay, I'm not going to say more about that right now. Uh, by the way, what's on the outside? If you went, if, if you could go um, outside of the outermost sphere, what would you find in uh, the medieval mind? Well, you would find eternity, right? This, this would just simply be pure existence. So in other words, this would be God, basically, um, in all directions. Um, the divine is what you would have. 
Um, yeah, okay. Uh, some more things that I'm gonna say, um, I actually need uh, other pictures for. So all of creation, all of this cosmos was thought, oh, it actually says that they're forever. I'm seeing that right now. Um, all of creation was thought to consist of two parts. The lower part, the lowest sphere, the sphere of the moon, the first sphere around the earth was thought to separate two basic parts of creation. So that's why the sphere of the moon is very important um, to the medieval mind. Everything above the sphere of the moon, so everything, uh, so all of the planets, for example, and then all of the stars and so on, was thought to be eternal. Everything above the moon was thought to be filled with light and filled with life and filled with perfection and harmony. Everything below the moon, by contrast, so in other words, everything on the earth, was thought to be changing, um, never the same, um, not eternal, um, not filled with light, not filled with life, but rather with death. Um, so the uh, theological term would be fallen. So everything below the moon was thought to be the fallen part of creation, where human beings live and human beings are sinful. Uh, they can do bad things. Bad things can happen as a consequence, basically. But all of this um, stuff does not happen within the cosmos above the moon, okay? So that really is um, the big difference there. So in other words, as you look towards the sky, and if you see something like Venus or Mercury or the sun, or actually any other star, if you, as soon as you look up and see a heavenly body, that's really what you're seeing. You're seeing heaven, right? You're seeing eternity in um, the medieval mind. Um, really important to keep in mind, maybe. Okay, um, we get the four elements. All of creation was made up of four, or actually five different substances. That is the four classical elements below the sphere of the moon. So everything on earth, in other words, uh, was thought to consist of these four elements, fire, air, water, and earth. And by the way, this is a small part of uh, this particular view of the world, which has sort of trickled down uh, to us today. So we still know the name of the, the names of the four classical elements. Um, fire, air, water, and earth. I'm going to say something about that um, in a second. Uh, for now, keep in mind, these four elements are really extreme. They're either very hot or very wet or very dry. Right. And, and um, things that are extreme mean, well, these things can change, right? Um, if you have water, that might freeze and become ice, for example. If you have a fire, the fire might go out um, and so on. So stuff can burn up, stuff can freeze, um, stuff can change. So the four elements are very liable to change. Everything above the moon is not liable to change. It's eternal, right? So they thought that everything above the moon must consist of a fifth element, which is where we get the word quintessence. That's what that word means. And this fifth element is called ether. And that's the heavenly element. Um, everything above the moon consists of ether, whatever that is, right? Uh, usually thought of as some kind of gas, I guess. Um, by the way, that's not what, what we in the modern world called, call ether. Um, that, that's something different, of course. Um, but if you uh, call something ethereal, right, we still use that adjective sometimes, um, then that means it, it, um, it's not made up of the four normal elements. It's, it's made up of heavenly stuff. Okay, um, here's an image uh, where you can see basically um, that the four elements are to be found below the sphere of the moon. So we have uh, earth, of course, and water, which are pretty heavy and they, they stay below, um, below human bodies uh, most of the time. Then we have air, which surrounds us, of course. It's lighter um, 
then the earth, and then we have fire. And they thought as as they thought fire um, was an element back then. Um, today we consider fire to be uh, a chemical process. Uh, but if you count fire as an element, then fire is even lighter than air. And so they thought there must be a belt of fire surrounding the atmosphere. So basically a pyrosphere, that would be the word uh, for that, I guess, um, right below the sphere of the moon. Okay. Um, now, human beings were thought to be a microcosm of the general macrocosm, so a, an image of the macrocosm. People believed in cosmic influences, and this could be taken very literally, influence. Um, so they thought there's, uh, there were substances kind of flowing down uh, from the perfect world, from the heavens, to humans, for example. Planets and spheres were thought to have power, for example, over certain organs within the human body. You see some here. So soul, that is the sun, has something to do with the heart, for example, uh, for some reason. Um, Mars beholdeth the gall, and so on. So you have um, those correspondences, but that's not all. In general, you have something known as the great chain of being, uh, floating around in people's heads. Now, this this particular expression became um, a bit more uh, uh, important in uh, the Elizabethan time in England. So, in in the in the time of William Shakespeare. But already in the Middle Ages, of course, people also believed that everything was linked together via correspondences. For example, the bodies and the souls of people would directly correspond to the world. And this has a lot to do with the theory of the four bodily humors or the four bodily fluids, which actually march parallel with the four elements. So just like everything below the moon consists of four elements, um, everything within the human body and actually also within the human soul in a way, so everything that, that can happen to you, um, has something to do with the four bodily fluids or the four humors. By the way, this is where we get the word humor. So humor um, back then it didn't mean to be funny necessarily, but it, mean, it means in general um, these four bodily fluids. What are the four bodily fluids? Well, you have English uh, words here, blood, phlegm, well, melancholy, black bile, that is, and choler or yellow bile. And as I said, they correspond to the four elements of air, water, earth, and fire. And just like the four elements, they're either hot and moist, so that would be blood, or cold and moist, that would be phlegm, uh, or dry and cold, or dry and hot. They also correspond, for example, to uh, the four seasons, as you see here, springtime, uh, summertime, uh, fall, and winter or childhood, youth, maturity, and old age, and so on. So um, people were thinking a lot in terms of these correspondences. And ideally, in an ideal human body and in an ideal human mind, of course, as well, uh, the four um, bodily fluids or the four tempers, um, the four uh, uh, character traits that we derive from the bodily fluids should be well balanced. Now, this is where we get the word temper, temperance. So if you lose your temper, that means you lose your balance, actually. You lose the right mixture of the four bodily fluids. Maybe you have too much or too little of something going on in your body. This is actually also why you have so much bloodletting, maybe because this was the easiest um, bodily fluid to access. Um, that you uh, have bloodletting uh, being prescribed as a cure for almost anything in the Middle Ages. Well, just go to go go to a barber uh, because that's where you would go actually, um, and have him draw some blood, uh, and then you will feel better probably. So the four bodily humors correspond, as I just said, to 
for example, uh, the four seasons and the four elements. They also correspond to certain planets. They also correspond to certain directions of wind um, and many, many other things. Um, so wherever you have the number four, basically, classically speaking, um, you have some kind of correspondence there. Um, I just mentioned planets again and um, zodiac signs. And yeah, I should men mention astrology in general. So astrology was, was another thing that became widespread actually towards the end of the Middle Ages um, through Arabian sources that um, started spreading uh, into Europe. Uh, so astrology became an important thing. Astrology is interesting because it was already in line with what people were already thinking, basically. It was in line with this worldview. People were already thinking in terms of correspondences, in terms of symbols a lot. Uh, for example, they, um, Christian authors would, would, would see stars uh, as angels, for example, right? And so... Um, it kind of makes sense uh, to the medieval mind that um, if you're already thinking in terms of these correspondences, oh, the, the I don't know, the, the heart corresponds with uh, this and this uh, planet or whatever, and the planet corresponds with this and this weekday, then of course, um, astrology comes in there. But um, Ackerman points out that, um, well, uh, writing about morals and about how you should behave was also a very important thing at the time. So moralists were generally very aware of the lingering danger of determinism behind astrology. If everything is written in the stars anyway, well, then it doesn't matter what I do, right? And so um, uh, people didn't take this very far. Um, in general, they, they thought, okay, um, people could still... Um, act in a way that's wise uh, or foolish and that this um, basically the choices you make are always stronger than anything that the stars uh, could do to you. Okay, so astrology was not um, necessarily seen as uh, from, a, from a very uh, deterministic um, point of view. Okay, um, but it was integrated um, by the late Middle Ages. Which brings me to the whole um, Christian worldview that we, of course, also have underlying. Uh, and one of the main things here to keep in mind is that um, the cosmos was thought to be harmonious and um, very perfect and basically eternal. Everything above the moon was thought to be eternal. So if everything is so perfect, so, so divine, um, divinely ordained, then why do bad things happen? That's one of the big questions um, of all time, of course, but also uh, particularly for the Christian Middle Ages. Uh, because um, you can say, well, there's, there's a lot of order, there's a lot of um, harmony in people's minds. So um, in order to solve, I can't really answer this question, but in order to, to may, maybe solve the conundrum a little bit, what they did was um, they found a place for everything, um, quite literally. So they said, well, God is generally in control of the harmonious eternal cosmos. But below the moon, we don't have eternity. We have stuff that changes. So God's servant, Lady Fortune, um, who actually gets the name of an actual Roman goddess, right? She kind of, she's an emblem of this. So she reigns over mankind's earthly destiny. Um, so this doesn't mean that they literally believed in this goddess or anything like that. But the, but the Christian writers of the Middle Ages um, thought that Lady Fortune, Fortuna, is a fitting image of um, the idea that we today would call shit happens, right? So shit happens in the Middle Ages, but only below the moon, only as long as you're basically alive in a human body and you're below the sphere of the moon. Um, that's where uh, bad things can happen. So um, this is another thing, basically, that has trickled down to us from the Middle Ages. We kind of still remember uh, the Wheel of Fortune, right? And, and this whole idea, you've probably seen that somewhere. So she keeps turning this wheel, which is an emblem of the fact that you don't know what's going to happen 
uh, even if you're, for example, very rich, uh, you might lose your money uh, the next day and become a beggar or something like that in the most extreme um, case. And this is why to the medieval mind, uh, here we get a lot, a lot of moralism again, this is why wealth and power, worldly wealth, worldly power are not to be trusted and there are many, many books, uh, many, many texts from the Middle Ages which were written about this idea. You have to also kind of keep in mind that the texts that are written in the Middle Ages uh, are written for upper class people, right? For people who can read and write. So a lot of texts are written for people who have power, who are um, socially superior to others and who ha are in some kind of power uh, situation. Um, and if you combine this with Christian morality, well, of course, it kind of makes sense that you will have a lot of texts that say, dear reader, now you have a lot of responsibility. So um, uh, try not to be an asshole, right? Try, even if you're in power, try to be a good person because you don't know how long you will stay in power and you might actually... Um, be under the power of someone else um, in the long run. And that's when you want to be treated well. Um, so Lady Fortune, uh, oh yeah, I should maybe also mention um, what these texts are called. So for example, you have Mirrors for Princes. That's a whole genre of texts from the late Middle Ages. Uh, in German, Fürstenspiegel, right? You, you, so you have the whole, a whole book genre that is um, made to um, convince uh, people who have responsibility to have um, to convince people who are in powerful positions um, to use their power for the good. Okay, uh, one more thing about Lady Fortune. Um, for example, uh, she's mentioned in um, Shakespeare's plays here in in King John. When Fortune uh, means. To men most good, she looks upon them with a threatening eye, uh, to pronounce that um, in the old-fashioned way. Or she's actually called that strumpet fortune. So basically, um, uh, you, she, she's unreliable, right? Okay, um, so much for Lady Fortune. Uh, let's move on. Um, and I would like to... Uh, basically just end with a quote um, by C.S. Lewis who writes about this whole idea of the harmonious cosmos and what this means to uh, the, the medieval writers. So to quote from Lewis, he says, char characteristically medieval man, um, forgive my gendered language here, um, so Lewis is writing this in the 60s of course, medieval man was not a dreamer nor a spiritual adventurer. He was an organizer, a codifier, a man of system. His ideal could be not unfairly summed up in the old housewifely maxim, a place for everything and everything in its right place. In medieval works, we see the tranquil, indefatigable, exultant energy of a passionately logical mind ordering a huge mass of heterogeneous details into unity. So harmonization is what I would call this. This is what was going on in a lot of um, medieval books that even if they're confronted with uh, many, many details that don't really seem to fit uh, the general picture, so they're reading uh, works of the church fathers, for example, but then they're also reading works of the ancient philosophers who say something very different about the world, but they they um the people in the middle ages try to harmonize all this and and um, create a unity around it all and one example would be to sort of integrate the the uh, character of lady fortune into an otherwise um christian uh view of the world and to say well uh now we have sort of an, an emblem of this idea that even though god is in control bad things happen right and so um, it was all about um, not only seeing correspondences everywhere, but also um, creating sort of a logical framework uh, around individual details that don't really seem to have a lot to do with each other. So it was all pretty much held together uh, to the medieval mind. 
Okay, um, for further reading about this, um, where did I get this knowledge? Well, I'm basing most of what I, what I just said on uh, my, my go-to book um, for learning about um, the medieval view of the world, which would be C.S. Lewis's book, The Discarded Image. Other books that um, talk about something very similar, um, but which focus on the Elizabethan worldview, that is the worldview of um, the time of William Shakespeare, uh, would be another classic by Tilliard, the Elizabethan world picture, or for example, um, a work by Hussey in which, uh, from which I took um, a lot of the illustrations here in this video actually. Russell's book, Inventing the Flat Earth, is um, the answer to the question, then why do people think that everybody in the Middle Ages thought um, the earth was flat and so on? So where did that um, um, urban legend basically come from? And uh, Schneider's book is, is, is an interesting book if you want to um, see uh, the role that mathematics and numbers uh, used to play in um, classical and medieval um, views of the world. You will see that a lot of these books are from the middle to the end of the 20th century. And that's basically when um, this was really studied uh, very heavily. Okay, that's the end of this video. And here are my sources.